you for joining us. I will just do without the introduction since it took us so long to get going. Um, thank you for coming. We are celebrating, hey, hey, um, we are celebrating Hoshana Rabba. So Hoshana Rabba, if you think about it, is a very strange, interesting holiday because um, on the one hand, we're in the middle of this Chag celebrating Simcha, our joy. On the other hand, all of a sudden we put on the brakes and we go back 15 days and we're about to have the final judgment. We're taking, we just took the fun out of Sukkot and made it into judgment day. Not only just judgment day, the ultimate judgment day, right? So what I want to try to understand is how, why, and, and what are we supposed to do with that? Okay, so now. The first thing that you have to understand is where did this become a judgment day? Well, you know, there's a Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah that says that there are four times of the year that the world is judged. And on Sukkot, we're judged for water. So now you have judgment. And then the Torah and the Shulchan Aruch, based on this, say that, um, well, water is really life. I mean, no water, no life. And so we're really being judged for our life. And so we need to laharbot. Be-tachanunim, not tachanunim in the sense of, of, um, of, of, of pleading mercy for stuff, but rather for salvation. You know, all these hoshana. Hoshana basically means save us. And so all the prayers are about salvation and saving us. And we're basically asking God, you know, give us a break. Let us have another good year. Okay. The Zohar takes this to the next step and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we're going to have judgment and we're going to ask God to give us a break, so that means tshuva. I mean, you can't just say, oh, give me a break, like, and, and not do anything about it. We need, we just went through this whole process. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Aser Yamei Tshuva. So the only way we're going to get this thing to work is if we do tshuva. So I'll just read for you in the, in the source sheets here. So the Zohar I have in the, at the top of the source sheet is in Aramaic, and then, the, then Rav Yehuda Ashlag translates it in the second section. section it says, Yoma Shivi'a Dechag. Yoma Shvi'i Shel Achag, Dehainu Behoshana Rabba, Hu Siyum Adin Shel Haolam, U Piskei Hadinim Yotzim Mi Beit HaMelech. So this is where we get this idea that this is Judgment Day, and the actual judgments are going out from the, the king, as it were, on this day. So now he comes below here and he explains. He says, Perush, ki gimos farim niftachim berosh Hashana. So he says there are three books that open. We all know the story on Rosh Hashana. There's the books of the Sadikim Murim, the, the totally righteous, the totally wicked, and the Benonim, the people in between. And the totally end side, so God knows what to do with them. And they're done. And then everything waits till Yom Kippur. And so we all, Benonim, try to do the best we can to say, we'll do better and give us the chance. And we do tshuva, we do introspection. And we try to say, listen, you know, I realize that this wasn't so good. And I'm going to try a little bit better go moving forward. Let me have a good year. Thank you very much. So now what happens is that the Zohar says, that's true. I mean, the Zohar just explained all that. Or rather, I should say, Rabbi Yehuda Ashlag explained that that's the Kavanah of the Zohar. And it says here, Omnam, od lo nigmar hadavar b'shleimut. However, even though all that's true, everybody knows this three books and Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, we're not done. It's not been completed b'shleimut in its wholeness. V'ninsa, b'yom ha-shvi'i, which found on the seventh day, Hoshana Raba, nigmara ha-hitlabshut ha-chokma b'chasadim, He's using some um, Kabbalistic terminology to try to explain, but in any case, it says, "Va'az nishlemet ha'chatima la'chaim shenasta b'yom ha'kipurim, while the varzel la'otam shelo asu tshuva." Now he says, "Now everything is completed on Yom Kippur for everybody that did tshuva, but there are still people that didn't quite do it, and you get a little more chance." And he says, "V'nechtemu l'mita b'yom ha'kipurim od lo nigmara la'gamre ha'chatima." Even though there's people that the Yom Kippur din said, uh, you didn't make it, it's not over. And he says, Ki yesh lahem zman lashuv. You, these people who didn't quite make the Yom Kippur cut still have another chance to return. 
עד ליום השביעי של הסוכות, until the seventh day of סוכות, ואם ישובו, and if they will do תשובה, if they will return, יתכפרו עוונותיהם. Their sins will indeed be um, forgiven, atoned for. And so that's where, this is it. This is the essence of, of Hoshana Rabbah. It started with a din about water and begging for water for the year and a realization that that water means life and a realization that if we're going to have it be for all of Sukkot, so the last day of Sukkot is the last day to get our life in order. And so the really the way you do that is by introspecting and trying to return, okay, to do tshuva. All that makes good sense, except I have one little problem. Um, we don't say vidui after Yom Kippur. No more tachanonim, no more vidui, no more bad stuff. We're done, right? We did Yom Kippur, and now, I mean, pretty much it's a sur to say vidui. We don't do al chetz. We don't do anything like that, right? For the whole rest of the month of Tishrei. And for sure on the Chag, it's a Chag. Yom Simchatenu. Talking about bad stuff is like, messes up our Simcha, right? Halachically, there's no vidui. We don't do it. We don't do Ashamnu. We don't do al chetz. We don't do none of, none of that. So what exactly is left to do tshuva? So to answer that question, I would like to move away from the halachic world for a minute and bring you into the world of philosophy, okay? And I would like to introduce you to a philosopher by the name of Thomas Nagel. Basically, he wrote a paper in 1979. He was, he was basically working in parallel with another philosopher by the name of Will, um, Bernard Williams. The two of them came up with this concept called moral luck which is the name of the shiur. So what exactly is moral luck? First, we'll read Thomas Nagel inside, and then we'll try to explain it in, in more layman terms. The problem of moral luck develops out of the ordinary conditions of moral judgment. Prior to reflection, before we think about it, he's saying, it is intuitively plausible that people cannot be morally assessed for what is not their fault, or for what is due to factors beyond their control, okay? That's pretty simple. Basically, what he's saying is that if you're going to judge somebody morally, you did a good thing, wow, praiseworthy. Oh, you did a bad thing. You need to do something about that. We need to punish you, or you need to punish, whatever. We understand, okay? A moral judgment is saying somebody did something, and it's either praiseworthy or blameworthy, okay? So now what he just said here, it is intuitively plausible, meaning the way we think, it's intuitive, that you can't be morally assessed for what is not your fault, okay? If something happened out of your control, so we say, it's out of your control. There's, a, there's, a, there's an idea even in Judaism, it's called onus rachmana patre. God forgives or, or, or completely removes, he just doesn't even consider things that you were done um, out of coercion, out of force, out of not having any ability to, to change the circumstances or, or what you would have done, okay? Okay. Without being able to explain exactly why, we feel that the appropriateness of moral assessment is easily undermined by the discovery that the act or attribute, no matter how good or bad, is not under the person's control. Makes sense, you had no control, so no problem. We have the thing also with uh, Are Miklat, right? Somebody goes to Are Miklat, to the, to the city of refuge, if he killed somebody, Khalila, by accident. Okay, if he did it, right? What's that? Right. But if somebody was Ba'onis Mamash, like um, there's an example that you're driving and, you know, you were driving too fast. And, um, and so, you know, you were driving a little bit too fast. So you were basically negligent. You hit somebody. So you go to the RME clock. You were drunk. You get you get the death penalty. You don't go to the RME clock. Now, that's the one extreme. The other extreme is that you were driving the speed limit. You were paying attention. Everything was good. Your car works. And some kid just bolted into the street. That's onus that you don't even go to our Amy Clot. You just go home. And you, you, know, you feel bad. But you didn't have anything to do with that. Okay. That's what he has um, no control. 
So we don't blame them. OK, so clear absence of control produced by involuntary movement. I'm about six lines down in the text. Physical force or ignorance of circumstances excuses what is done from moral judgment. But what do we what we do depends in many more ways than these on what is not under our control. What is not produced by a good or bad will in Kant's phrase and external influences in this broader range are not usually thought to excuse what is done from moral judgment, positive or negative. Ultimately, nothing or almost nothing about what a person does seems to be under his control. Okay, so now that was a lot of that was a lot of philosophical jargon. Basically, now let's make it with a very simple example. Okay, I like to use the example of my Aliyah, or so everybody here also made Aliyah. So basically, you know, we get a lot of praise for making Aliyah. You know, people say like, wow, that's amazing. You know, you left your family, your language, your work, your, your infrastructure, your everything you know about life. And you came to a country that you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, um, the economics and, and security situation, let's say, is challenging. Um, and you did all that because there's a commandment in the Torah that says you should live in Israel. Wow, that's really amazing. Kola kavod, right? So now Thomas Nagel, Nagel will say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let's, let's look at this and see if that wasn't just really moral luck, like that you were just sort of lucky that there were all these circumstances that, that led to this that you really didn't have a whole heck of a lot to do with. For example, they'll say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's look at you. You were born at a time when Israel was strong in the land. The nation of Israel was on the rise. You were born to a family that um, was very Zionistic. You could say it was in your DNA. You were raised among people who everybody believed that really the Jews should live in the land of Israel. So if we move away all these sort of luck factors, you didn't really do anything. <laughs> so there's really not much to praise you about. I mean, it was really like, I, I mean, really, it's, it, it, you take away my parents, you take away my timing, you take away my friends. There's no way I would make Aliyah. So, so basically, it was moral luck, meaning it was a moral move. We did something that God says. We did try to do a good thing. But um, really, you did it, it, all the factors that brought you here were out of your control. So what Thomas Nagel is saying here is what, what he said is that, that there's many external influences, external and internal, that it's not just a kid ran into the street. There's many things that influence us, influence our, our decisions. And, our, and, and so we can't even really be morally judged, not for good and not for bad, right? Like, I mean, why did I do this sin? Well, I mean, you know, I was raised in a family that let eat cheeseburgers. And so, you know, I, I eat cheeseburgers. But so so you can the 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 play, the claim goes both ways. And um, Thomas Nagel brings the example of Nazis. So he says, look, you know, there was a quiet factory worker who used to, you know, run the factory floor. And he just happened to be in Berlin when Hitler rose to power and they moved him from the factory to the concentration camp. And so now, moral luck, he now finds himself a concentration camp guard. But I mean, if he had left three years earlier and went to Canada, he would have continued to be uh, a, a factory foreman and nothing would have happened. And so he's, what he's saying here is that our intuitions run to a problem here because, wait a minute, you're going to tell me we're not going to judge Nazis? We're going to tell me you're not going to say somebody made Aliyah, did something? I mean, so our intuitions on the one hand say people who were under the influence of X, Y, and Z factors, whatever they are, are not responsible. On the other hand, that basically undermines all of our judgments. We can't judge anybody for anything. And so that's what he says on, the, on page two. The view that moral luck is paradoxical is not a mistake. There's a paradox here. On the one hand, we say, you know, if you're not in control, you can't be judged. On the other hand, we say, well, we need to judge people for what they did. And so there's a paradox. And he said, it's not a mistake. It's not an ethical mistake. It's not a logical mistake, but a perception of one 
of the ways in which we the intuitively acceptable conditions of moral judgment threaten to undermine it all. We cannot simply take ex an external evaluative view of ourselves or what most essentially are and what we do. And this remains true even if we have seen that we are not responsible for our own existence, our own nature, or the choices we have to make, or the circumstances that give our acts the consequences they have, those acts remain ours and we remain ourselves despite the persuasiveness of reasons that seem to argue us out of existence. Basically what he's saying, again, is that intuitively we say that, you know, if you're not in control and you have all these other factors, so then you're not responsible. But if we take that logic, that intuition to the nth degree, we've now just argued ourselves out of existence. I mean, who am I? What I'm nothing, right? Of course, I'm who, my parents and the time I was born and my friends and, 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 and everything. So once you start pulling that away, so there's no, there's no person, there's no nothing. So he says it's a paradox and he says we accept it and he says this is how we have to judge people even though it doesn't really make sense because we just said that if you're not in control you're not responsible. Okay so that's the world of philosophy. Now I want to bring it back to the, what do the Jews say. Okay it turns out that the Jews have been talking about this arguing about this since the Gemara. Okay and continuing through medieval times until our times. So the, the Gemara that I, that I want to use um, is a Gemara. It's a famous Gemara in Abu Dazara. It's the story of Elazar ben Dordia. Ele, the story of Elazar ben Dordia has to be brought up by Darshanim every year during this time of judgment from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. And I'm extending it to Hoshana Rabbah, which is, as we said, the day of judgment. So for those of you who aren't familiar, we'll go through the story. It's a very nice story. It says... Um, it was said of Elazar ben Dordia that there wasn't a prostitute in the world that he didn't make an effort to visit. So he heard once that there was a prostitute in a town of, on a beach town and he takes so much money. So Natal kisti narim, he got the money together. Halach v'avar alea shiva narot. He went and crossed seven rivers, which means that he was very interested in making this happen. B'sha'at haregel, regel hadavar heficha. At the time when he was getting together with the woman, the woman um, passed wind, it says here. Amra, k'shem shehaficha zo, eina chozeret lemekoma, kach Elazar ben Dordia, and so when that happened, so the prostitute said to him, I have heard on high, at least that's what the commentators say, there was a bat kol that said, just as this wind that I have passed will not come back to its place, so too Elazar ben Dordia will never be accepted in heaven. Elazar ben Dordia can never do tshuva. So now, Elazar ben Dordia was shocked. He just realized that his whole life was worthless. Because by the way, you know, visiting prostitutes is, is not um, condoned by the Torah and there are actually rules against doing it, but you don't get karet. You don't get that you never can go to the next world. Uh, you get lashes, you get this, whatever. There's a, it, it's a contained issue. But Elazar ben Dordia is being judged for his lifestyle. He's basically thrown away ethics and, and, and morals and an intellect, and he's made his life aesthetic. I'm just going to enjoy myself, and I don't care about anything else. And that life has been judged, according to the story, to be completely worthless to the point that you have no place in the next world. So now, Elazar ben Dordia was shaken, even though he is what I like to call a bon vivant. He liked to have a good time. But he realized that, I mean, the next world is nothing to sneeze at. And so he better do something about it. But he didn't do tshuva. He went to the mountains and hills. He said to the mountains and hills, please ask mercy for me. Right? Let, get me out of this. They said, what? We also have to worry about ourselves. We don't have time to deal with you. Okay, 
Amar Shamayim Ba'ar. So he went to the heavens and the earth. And he says, Bakshu Alai Rachamim. And they said the same thing. We can't help you. So he went to the Chamau Levana. He went to the sun and the moon. And he said the same thing. He said, please help me out. And they said, we can't help you. He went to the Kochavim and the Mazalot, the stars and the constellations. And they said, we can't help you. And so now at the, the second to last yellow line, uh, underlined parts, it says, This is only dependent on me. He cried until his uh, soul went out. The, the voice from heaven came out and said, And so the story ends that he was accepted into heaven. Not only was he accepted into heaven, he was accepted as a rabbi, meaning that he had achieved whatever religious level that one could achieve. Um, and so not only was he accepted, he was accepted with accolades. Now, what I would like to understand are these mashalim. Like, what went on here? What was he thinking going to the, the, the heavens and the earth, the sun and the moon and all this stuff? What, what, is, what does that have to do with anything, right? And why go through all of these things? I mean, we got it already on the first one, right? You tried to get out of it. You can't get out of it. Okay. But no, he went to all these things. So I found a really interesting perush by this uh, Rav Aaron Levin. Hashem Yikom Damo. Um, he was a big rabbi in Galicia, and um, he was taken away to Auschwitz and finished off there. He left many, many books. One of them was this Hadrash Vahayun, where he talks about this story of Elazar ben Durdia, And he says, why did he go to all these uh, natural entities to try to get out of it? So he says, rucho ha-so'er va-so'en. He went to try to, to calm his agitated nerves and see if he could get out of this. He went to try to figure out if he had any merit. I can get out of this. And he tried to find this merit in these four causes, these four entities. Because these entities were there when he sinned, and actually they caused him the guilt. They caused him to sin and be guilty. And so they should bear his sin. So now, um, Rav Aaron Levin basically tries to explain how each of these four entities can parallel kind of causes that make people sin. So basically what he's saying here is that it was moral luck. I was just unlucky. And these four causes were just basically all kinds of causes that made me do something that if they weren't there, I really wouldn't have done it. What's insane about this whole little story is that Thomas Nagel in the paper that we started reading brings no less and no more than four causes that people are driven by that cause them to do things that maybe are or not in their control. So let's go through them. If you go to the table on, on the last page, page five, um, so let's see what it says here. Okay. So the first one is called causal luck. Causal luck is how one is determined, is in how one is determined by antecedent causes or antecedent circumstances. Basically, um, what he's saying is that one thing leads to another. One cause, com one, something causes something, causes something, right? Um, the description here in the second column, it says, even it turns out that determinism is false, meaning not everything is deterministic like dominoes falling. Nevertheless, events are still caused by prior events. You know, 
I went to shul, and so there was a kiddish, so I drank whiskey, and so then I drank too much, and so I fell when I came home, etc. One thing leads to another, okay? It's not deterministic, but it's causes. One thing caused another, okay? So basically, if I didn't go to shul, I would have never fallen down drunk. I mean, why? Well, don't blame me. You told me to go to shul. Okay. So basically, Rav Elazar ben Dordia says, one thing leads to another. Ah. And I found myself in this prostitute's house. Ah. I don't know how I got here, really. Okay, so that's like the mashal of that is the hills and the mountains. You know, hills lead to mountains. One thing leads to another. One cause brings another cause until you get into trouble. Okay, so that's causal um, luck. Then Thomas Nagel brings the next thing. It's called constitutive luck. Constitutive luck is basically, I'm reading here, is luck in one in who one is, in the traits and the dispositions that you have. In the next column over, it says, since our genes, our caregivers, our peers, our other environmental influences all contribute to who we are. So basically, like we said, you know, I mean, I, you know, I was born in this place. I was made in this way. You know, I have these certain traits. I have these certain friends. And so I did what I did, but I mean, if I was born at another time to other parents, I would have never done this. And so basically, Rabbi Azar ben Dordia, he says, um, like heaven and earth, right? He says, the heavens and the earth are like the spiritual and the physical, like man who is made of soul and body. It's the same idea. It's how I'm constituted, what I'm made of. The heavens and the earth make up the world. The soul and the body make up the person. And don't blame me. It's just the way I am. So the third one is circumstantial luck. It's the luck in the circumstances one finds oneself. Okay, so this is, again, like um, the idea of that, that basically Rabbi Yelzar ben Dordia would say, it was the circumstances that let me hear. The, the things that happen like, um, you know, today I just happened to be on the street and I saw this ad for a prostitute and that. There are circumstances that you can blame things on the circumstances. And the circumstances are our daily circumstances, just like the sun and the moon fix our day. So too, there are circumstances that happen and, and there are circumstances that are out of our control. Things happen on a daily basis. And, and they bring us to do certain things, okay? Um, and then the final one is resultant luck, okay? Resultant luck is the way things turn out, okay? So the, the classic example is of two friends that go to a bar and they both get drunk and they both get in their car, okay? And they both drive home and one of them gets home, nothing happened, he goes to sleep. The other one, a kid ran into the street and he didn't stop in time and he ran him over. Now, the fact of the matter is that morally, they both did exactly the same bad thing. They drove drunk. But we judge the guy who hit somebody much worse than the guy who didn't. So basically what is result in luck is saying is that we judge people and actions based on the consequences. So Rebel Azar ben Dordia will say, look, it's true. I, I, I like women and I look for women who are available um, for pay. It's true. But if there were no women available for pay, so I would have never done such a thing and they would never be judging me. It was just bad luck. It was just based on the stars and the constellations. It was Astro in, in, it was astrological luck. I mean, basically in the Hebrew, it works much better, right? It was bish mazal. It was based on the mazalot, the kochavim and the mazalot. So basically what I'm saying here is that you're, you understand that these four types of, of circumstances are real, okay? And we do really judge people based on, you know, one thing caused another, and maybe it was out of my control more. Maybe it was out of my control less. There are circumstances. Again, you can't deny the fact that we were born at a time when it was very easy to get on a plane and come to Israel. You know, if we were born in the 1700s or the 1800s, I mean, would we be with the students of the Vilna Gaon on a boat coming to live in, in, in dire poverty? So 
there are circumstances that really you have to take into control uh, and into account. And, 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 and the whole thing about, you know, that we were raised in, in Zionist Orthodox circles and that was encouraged as opposed to being raised in, with, in Satmar that says you better not go there. I mean, all of these things are factors. And what, again, um, Thomas Nagel is saying is that nevertheless, we still judge people based on what they did. And we still praise people who made Aliyah and we still put people who drive drunk and hit somebody in jail. And we do that, but, but nevertheless, we're sort of, we need to understand, you know, how does this fit all these things that you have in control or you don't have in control? So if we go back to page three, um, where I have some more Jewish sources, uh, yeah, page three. So, like I said, this has been discussed from the times of the Gemara till now. I chose to bring a couple of, of modern sources that really, really answer the questions that I'm asking right now. Like, how do we really deal with this issue of control versus judgment and praiseworthiness versus blameworthiness? So, Rav Tzaduk Akon Milublin in Sidkat HaTzadik. So, he writes as follows. Let me just um, move this over. No, not moving. Just a minute. Go over here. No, nope, not moving. Um, having a hard time to move this thing. Can't, why can't I get it? Um, ah, okay, I think, yeah, I got it. Okay. It says, Pa'amim yesh adam. Are you guys with me, Rab Tzadok, on third page? Pa'amim yesh adam omed benisayon gadol kol kach ad she'i efshar lo shelo yecheta. There are times when somebody stands before a difficult test and, and he, he has no possibility other than to sin. Like they say in a story in Brachot, and this is an amazing Brachot. He didn't know my drash and he didn't know I was going to talk about Elazar ben Dordia, but look what he writes. Amar Rabbi Chia bar Abba. Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Mashal. I'm going to give you an example about a difficult test that somebody is just not going to pass. There was a case of a man who had a son. The, the, the man bathed and, and anointed his son. Basically, he took care of him physically. He, he fed him and he gave him to drink. And he put a, a, a bag of money on his neck. And he put him to sit at the entranceway of a brothel. Maya se otoha ben shelo yechata. Is it possible that this kid is not going to sin? That's what the Gemara says. Exactly what we've just been saying. If you if you're raised, your constitutive luck and your circumstantial luck are going to put you in that brothel. There's just nothing to do. Okay, so it's exactly Thomas Nagel, right? So now, what's the answer that the Tzidkat HaTzadik says? Maya sehaben? Oh, that's actually the end of the Gemara. Okay. Now, where the, where the words are bolded. bolded. Ubezehu nechshav ones gamur de rachmana patre. He says, this is completely um, coerced action, which God just throws out of court. God forgives this. The kid had no, ch the kid hadn't have a chance. Okay. The gum. And he says also that if somebody's Yetzer Hara is, is somehow inflamed, is incited, he says, to the point where he just has no chance of overcoming it, that's also considered Ones. It's also considered coercion or, or compulsion. And if God arranged it for that way, then that's just the way God wanted it. Whatever, he brings another Gemara that talks about how um, even if somebody was forced in the beginning and then they chose to continue with what they were forced to do in the end, you know, you forced me to eat cheeseburgers but now I said, not bad, these cheeseburgers. So, so um, that's also considered onus because I was forced into this whole thing. I never had a chance. All right. 
So now um, in the bolded part, again, at the end, he says, Aval, what are we supposed to do with this? Adam atzmo eno en yachol la'aid al atzmo beze. Ki ulay adain hayalo koach lechofet hayetze. So he says, this is all very nice in theoretical philosophy, but practical on the ground, you have no idea if, you know, the reason you're making Aliyah is because you had the friends and the thing and the what. No, you have to do what you have to do. And, you know, you didn't have to drink so much at the Kiddush and you didn't have to continue eating the cheeseburger and you didn't, whatever. Okay. All of these force factors that we're bringing up, that's for God to judge. We have to take responsibility for ourselves. We have no idea what forced me, what didn't force me. We have to look objectively at what we're doing and say, I take responsibility for myself. Okay. Now, Rav Hutner, who is sort of the, the, the student in the sense of that he learned this Rav Tzadok's Torah, was influenced by his Torah. So he picks this up and takes it to the next step. And that's the next source. So in the Pachad Yitzchak, he says, um, he's asked a question, okay? And the questioner says, from Malachim Aleph, it says, ki yechetu lecha, ki ein adam asher lo yechete, v'anafta bam, v'natatam lifnei iyov, oyev. So he says like this, in Malachim, it says that there is no person in the world that doesn't sin. But nevertheless, God gets angry and and Let's the enemies at him. Okay? So he said, well, so now the question is like this. So Okay, so the, the, the Rav Hutner, the Pachad Yitzchak, is writing to this guy who wrote him and said, I don't get it, okay? If there's no person who won't sin, so that really refers to sins that are outside of my control. They're, they're above my choice. They're sins that I just did, okay? But nevertheless, it says enough. It says God is angry with that person. So Rav Hutner says, you're writing me and you're saying that you're confused by this. Let me explain. That's exactly our question. How can God be mad at somebody who did something that's beyond their choice, beyond their free will, their bechira? So he says as follows in the underlying part. He says, Mikom akom hu lamala mikoch hasagato shel ha'adam l'achlit eze mechat'av na'asu bekoch so he says, again, like Rav Tzadok said, you don't know what was in your control and what wasn't in your control. What really, you know, you had something to do about and you, and you chose to do the wrong thing versus something that you didn't have. So he says, Umamele mechuyav so he says, because you have no idea, did I do this because my DNA was that way and I had no choice or not? So he says, you have to do tshuva on everything. And he says, and he, I'm skipping to the underlying part, but din hu Hachuva. So now Rav Hudner says, this isn't just a nice idea, okay? God is going to judge you for every action, not because you were responsible. Onus Rahmana Patre. It's true. You know, you had something that just said, you know, I'm an alcoholic, whatever. I don't want to use specific things, but whatever. Some, there was something that somebody didn't have any choice to do. Like the, like the Gemara's thing, that the kid was raised in front of a brothel, Okay. You still have to do tshuva, not because God didn't give you off for that, that you were forced, but because you have to do tshuva for everything. And now he brings a really interesting proof. He says in the next paragraph where I have it circled, he says, we say in the Shemona Asrei every day, Baruch Hashem Elokeinu Harotzeh You are the God who wants 
tshuva. So now Rav Hudner says, it should have said, hamitratzeh b'tshuva, the one who is reconciled by tshuva. Blessed are you, God, who, when I do tshuva, so you're reconciled with me, mitratzeh. It doesn't say that. It says harotzeh. God doesn't, God just wants us to do tshuva. So he's saying, you have to do tshuva. You don't say, oh, that's not me. No, it wasn't my fault. No, I was born at the wrong time. No, I was born to the wrong parents. No, I, you know, it was the circumstances of the hills and the mountains. It was the circumstances. That, no, God wants your tshuva. God will, you, it's up to God to say, no, you didn't have anything to do with that. You did have to do with that. It's up to us to do tshuva. It's almost as if it's kind of like, uh, for those of you who know Hitchcock, it's the MacGuffin. It's this little, the, the sin is basically something that allows us to do tshuva. God wants us to do tshuva. Tshuva is an amazing thing. It's what brings us close to God. It's what makes us stop and say, who are we and what is our lives? And let's try to improve ourselves. Not, let's get out of this. Let's find stadei zachut and try to figure out how we can overcome all of this. And now, um, just to round out this whole idea, I think that Rav Dessler brings this as an overarching philosophy of life. And he says, you know, there's a Gemara, famous Gemara in Brachot, it says, Akol bidei shamayim chutz mi yirat shamayim, right? Everything is in the hands of heaven, except for the fear of heaven, except for our moral choices, except for the good and bad that we do. But where is that good and bad? We just said that we do all kinds of stuff under coercion. So Rav Dessler says as follows, Everyone has free choice at his nekudat bechira, at his point of free choice. But the position of the point of free choice itself is determined by various factors, causal, constitutive, resultant, etc. So he says, um, this may be affected by his own previous choices, causal, which may have raised or lowered his point of free choice, or it may be affected by factors outside of his control, right? DNA and friends and timing and everything. Divine providence may have placed him from childhood in a certain environment. There is no free choice except at the point of free choice. And this is fixed by antecedent factors, causal luck. But there are no outside factors which can affect the act of choice itself. Here, the human being himself reigns supreme. This is also the meaning of the famous statement, all is in heaven except for the fear of heaven. All that befalls a person, everything that determines where his choice shall take place, the level of his choice, as well as the kind of test to which he will be submitted is all from heaven. The only thing in man's hands is the fear of heaven, which is the sense of responsibility to the truth, which he can either adopt or reject as he wills. So basically, what I'm saying, or I'm proposing, is the answer to this whole idea of moral luck is that, yeah, we accept the fact that there are all these factors, okay? But nevertheless, what we as religious people say is that God put us exactly in this point of choice to fix ourselves and to fix the world. We believe that we have a soul that came down here for a purpose. And God chose exactly where to place us and how to place us and when to place us so that we could fix whatever it is that we need to fix in ourselves and the people around us. And that's the nekudah bechira that we work at. All else is in the hands of heaven. And we don't go around saying, oh, that's not my fault. That's not my problem. No, we accept responsibility. And that's exactly what I propose we are supposed to do today. As I said in the beginning, Hoshana Rabbah is a day of tshuva on a day we can't do tshuva. Right? We cannot say vidui. We cannot say alchet. We cannot say ashamna. We cannot do tshuva formally like on Yom Kippur or the Aseret Yemei Tshuva. Today we rejoice. The only tshuva that we can do is take responsibility for ourselves to say that I accept who I am and where I am and how I am. And I will try to do the best I can with what I am given because that is from heaven. We should all be Zoha to another year of life, health, 
happiness and all kinds of moral factors that will help us to really do God's will. And as they say in Yiddish, a good kvittel.